to this video on how to give effective feedback. Okay, to start with, I thought we would use our ice cream text. So if you remember, this is a text written by a grade five or six student, um, ESL, and looking at ice cream and working on vocabulary to do with flavors and all that kind of stuff. Right, so we use this text to look at error correction. What kind of errors to correct? So let's have a quick look at that again. Remember, do we correct all our students' errors? As we're correcting, which errors should we be focusing on? And should we write the correct form for the student or simply circle or highlight the mistake? So just a reminder, we have a correction strategy in place. You have a checklist to decide what errors to correct first. So your first step is to look at the student's work. How many errors approximately are there? Step two, decide how many errors is just enough to focus on. So the rule of thumb is about three to five errors. Okay, not too many more because it will overwhelm the student and uh, stop them from focusing on things. Remember that if you have the same error that's repeating over and over, that counts as one. So that's a repeating error. Step three is to use the checklist to prioritize which errors you'll focus on, okay? So the checklist again is, the first one is errors that are stigmatized. So remember that a lot of second language or foreign language students don't understand that things like the F word that they hear all the time in movies are not acceptable for writing in, in student papers for their teacher. Um, the next one are errors that lead to a communication breakdown. So things that really stop them from being able to send their message, which is the goal of communication. The next priority is errors that have been the focus of instruction. So if this is one you've really been working on, then that's what you should be focusing on correcting first with the kids. They should have acquired this. They should have got it. Uh, the next priority is errors that have been selected by the teacher or learner themselves. This is especially when you get them involved in setting their own goals for language learning. Errors that occur frequently, because remember this is uh, highest return on investment. If you correct this one error and they're making the same mistake 10 times in a text, you've now corrected 10 mistakes with one correction. Um, errors in high frequency words or expressions. So these are things that they'll probably be likely to use over and over and over again. So useful words, useful expressions. And finally, any other errors or suggestions for improving style based on ability and the level of student. So you'll find with the really advanced students that they really maybe even don't make any mistakes at all, in which case you want to suggest a place to improve by including things like imagery or dialogue or, you know, other great stuff like that. Okay, so let's get back to our love ice, ice cream. For this one, I chose the following errors. The first one was Baja Papa because it impedes understanding. The next one I chose was The Sunday. I think that the Sunday also impedes understanding. We don't know if it's like a specific Sunday they're talking about or just Sundays in general. Uh, chocolate is misspelled. And this was a focus of instruction, right? So we were talking about ice cream in different flavors. They should know how to spell this. And also it appears frequently because they spelled chocolate correctly in the bottom. The last one is flavors of ice cream. It's something that we're going to see a lot. Flavors of ice cream, flavors of gum, flavors of candy, flavors of um, different things. So I think that if we teach them the collocation flavors of, that they'll be able to use that again and again. Okay. Um, did we correct these errors directly? Oh, I mean directly. Ha ha. Um, or indirectly. So direct corrections are for learners who are not proficient enough, remember? So if they can't figure it out on their own, it's for, air, for learners who are focusing on a new form. Anytime they're doing peer corrections, they should be doing it directly. And when you're not sure what a student is trying to say, but you want to take a guess, it's always better to be safe and sorry and give them a direct correction for a good model. Uh, yeah, example of what to say. What about indirect correction? Oops, error, haha. Ha. So indirect correction is for more advanced learners. You wanna just draw their attention to the mistake so that they can figure it out. 
and it's also for highlighting a mistake in a previously seen form so like they did with the chocolate in the past one right so the sunday chocolate chip ba -ba -ba -ba. i've highlighted them and i've decided to correct the sunday directly because i'm not sure what they're trying to say so i'm going to say sundays and i'll put a little question mark to say i'm not sure F favorite flavors of ice cream this is not something that they'll be able to get on their own it's a collocation so i'm going to indicate that they're missing something here and write it in say i think you meant to say favorite flavors of but the other two oops the other two you'll notice i just leave highlighted because really they were able to do the chocolate down here and bah, 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 they should notice right away <laughs> it's in french not english all right so now that we've gone through how to do error corrections and just did a quick recap of that let's focus on how to improve student writing and this is done with feedback so what is feedback and this is where that great article by grant wiggins comes in seven keys to effective feedback if you haven't read it already now's the time to go back and look at it so Grant Wiggins says that feedback is the most powerful tool to improve student learning because it gives us information about how we're doing in our efforts to reach a goal. And you can't improve unless you know how close you are to getting to your goal. And most importantly, it does not include value judgments. So this is where the little clash between grades and evaluation and feedback come in. So what kind of qualities does good feedback have? Again, Grant Wiggins says that these are the seven keys. The first one that it's goal referenced. So when it, we're talking about writing the, and speaking, the goal there is to communicate clearly, to communicate your message. So how well are the students communicating their message? That's the goal. Your feedback should be tangible and transparent. In other words, the students should really be able to understand what you're trying to say. So you have to be careful with your language. Remember that these are second language students. Keep your feedback short and concise and easy to understand. It should be actionable. Okay, so the students should be able to know exactly what they have to do when they read your feedback. Uh, user friendly, yeah, so they should be able to understand it. Timely is important, and this is really tough for teachers when you have a whole ton of corrections to do, but the faster they get the feedback to the student, the more impact it will have because it's fresh in their mind. Ongoing, so feedback is part of a whole process, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, yeah, actually in the next slide. And you should be consistent. So if you're saying one thing, make sure you consistently say the same thing again and don't change your mind. Makes sense. Okay. I mentioned the golden rule. Here's the thing about feedback. The golden rule is you should only give feedback to students. So only give them feedback on their written work if you give the students a chance to improve. So what does that mean? It means don't write extensive feedback on a final draft of students' work that they're getting a grade on. There's no point. You might as well just give a grade and a quick comment and they can come and see you if they want an explanation for why they got the grade. You shouldn't bother giving extensive feedback unless they can take that paper back and rewrite and make changes and do something better as part of the writing process. And if you don't believe me, <laughs> I suggest you go and give it a try because you'll find out the first thing they do, you spend you sweat your sweat out 10, 15, 20 minutes on each student's page, which gives you takes you hours to correct a whole class. You give it back to them. What do they do? They take a look at it and look at the grade and put it in the recycling bin. So there's absolutely no point in you wasting your time giving all that really wonderful feedback if they don't have a chance to do something with it. Okay, let's move on. Here are some examples that Grant Wiggins gives in his article of different kinds of comments teachers typically give. Things like, good work, this is a weak paper, you got a C on your presentation, or I'm so pleased by your poster. Now, these are not useful because they're not actionable um, and they're not really 
goal referenced. We don't really know how to improve. We don't know why it's a weak paper. We don't know what we did that was good. We've all received feedback like this and it's a little frustrating to know what you did well, what you didn't do well. You know, we need that kind of information if we're going to improve. So Wiggins suggests we recast these comments into useful feedback. And how do we do it? The tip is to always add a mental colon after each statement of value. Okay, and we're going to frame it as the effect it has on you as a receiver of the message rather than what the person did right or what they did wrong. Okay, so how does this work? Well, another way to think about it is a think aloud or a write aloud protocol. So this means that as you're going through the paper and giving feedback, write what you are thinking as you read. And remember, if the goal of the writing is to communicate a message clearly, then your feedback should be focused on how the message is received by you as the reader. So that may seem to be easy to say, but what does it actually look like? Well, let's take a look. Let's go back to two of the value comments that we got before. So good work. Okay, this is a weak paper. All right, so let's work on these each one at a time. So good work, why is it a good work? What's good about it? Well, this is what Grant Wiggins says. You notice that nice little colon here? So colon, why is it good work? Well, Grant Wiggins suggests we write something like this. It's good work because your use of words was more precise in this paper than in the last one. And I saw the scenes clearly in my mind. Do you see how that works as the effect on the reader, the effect that the message had? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So good work, your use of words was more precise, so that's for the first paper. Let's have a look at this is a weak paper. This is incredibly frustrating for students to receive a comment like this. It's a weak paper, okay, so tell me how I'm supposed to improve. Again, let's have a look and see. The period has now changed to a colon. And why is it a weak paper? Well, this is what Grant Wiggins has given as an example of how you can improve that. Almost from the first sentence, I was confused as to your initial thesis and the evidence you provide for it. Okay, this is a reader, right? A reader reading through it. The reader is confused to the initial thesis and the evidence. So as a reader, the message isn't clear. You're not reaching your goal. In the second paragraph, you propose a different thesis, which confused me. Okay, so this is what happened. And that was the action. It confused me. In the third paragraph, I wasn't convinced. The reader is not convinced the effect. You're not reaching your goal, the goal to be convinced. Why? Because there's no hard evidence, just beliefs. So you would probably follow this up by saying, be clear on your, on your thesis and you would give an example in the second paragraph. Propose, make sure you're consistent with the thesis and then you would remind the, re the writer what the thesis was. And in the third paragraph, um, include hard evidence, for example, and then you would highlight the beliefs. So you tell the student exactly what the problem is as you read through it as a reader. Okay. Um, and keep in mind too, that once you get practiced at doing this sort of thing, anytime that you find yourself writing down, good job, nice work, put a little colon and then explain why it's a good job or why it was bad work or why it was a weak paper. And you're gonna find that eventually you can just get rid of this, right? And leave it like this so that, it, that your feedback starts to look something like this. Take out the value altogether. Your use of words was more precise in this paper than the last one. I was confused um, for your initial thesis. Okay. Okay, so that is a lot more helpful to the student. And as I said, if you add in some actions here about how they can make this even better, that'll be even more helpful. So again, let's go back. When you're giving feedback, the first thing you need to do, read through the text, read through it once quickly to get a good sense of it, and then read through the text again more closely. Think, how clear was the message? How close were they to getting to the goal? If the goal is to convince someone, are they convincing someone? If the goal is to give information, was the information clear? What were you as a reader thinking about as you read the text? Were you confused? 
Were you excited? Did you enjoy a certain part? Why did you enjoy a certain part? What made it really great and what made it weak? What can you say to the student to improve the text? If this paragraph is confusing or this sentence is really confusing, explain, this sentence is really confusing. If you take out a few of these words or make the sentences shorter, it'll be a lot easier for the reader to read. The last thing is, can you offer any strategies for the student? I suggest that they highlight the thesis and remind themselves what it is as they go through. Use a dictionary, um, get a peer to edit, okay? all of those things. All right, so let's go back to our original text, the love ice cream. And as you remember here, I highlighted the mistakes that we're going to correct. I gave some direct corrections where I thought it was appropriate. And I gave some feedback. So here is the Sundays. Did you mean Sundays in general or one specific Sunday? So I've given the correction and I've also given some feedback. For this one, check the spelling. And I put a little arrow here to say, hey, guess what guys, you spelled it, you spelled it right here. What about here? For this one, I would say something on the side here, like we say flavors of ice cream in English. So the kid knows exactly what we have to correct. And for barapapa, I might write something like this, French, what is the English word? Here's your strategy, check your dictionary. Okay, so we see how these are all very specific and concrete ways to fix the mistakes. And I might give them a little oh, summary feedback like this. Reading about ice cream sundaes in your text made me hungry. That was the effect on the reader, right? Why is it good? You use a lot of adjectives. What is the effect? It helped me to imagine your ice cream. Yeah, I like little emojis. It helps to portray tone. Kids like it too. Action, fix your mistakes and hand it in again. So here's the mistakes. Here's what they have to do. And hopefully that will help them improve. Remember, hand it in again. We don't just leave it there, we hand it back in. Finally, just so you know, effective feedback, like anything else in teaching, the tougher teaching skills and the most effective ones, takes a lot of practice. I only read this article about five, ten years ago, five years ago maybe. I'm still trying to figure out how to give effective feedback. I'm still working on this. I'm still tempted to say, good work, nice job, really good. I'm still working on putting in the mental colon. So it's something that we're working on and developing as we keep going through our practice. And just before you go, my last word to you is, again, remember the golden rule. If you don't want all your hard work to end up in the recycling bin, only give feedback if you give students a chance to improve. Thanks.